this thing started. How would you describe what it is that you do? You know, what exactly is your work here in this life? Well, the easiest way to describe it is to say that I'm a writer. And I have since 2002, I made a living writing about spirituality. Um, won't really say it's general self-help, it's more esoteric spirituality. So that's the primary thing. And I've created a number of websites where so there's a lot of material that's available for free. So um, I give away more than I actually sell, but uh, I've still managed to survive since 2002 on that. Mm. So what do you write about, if you could describe that? Well, I write about any kind of very broad. Um, I have... I found a spiritual path when I was 18, and that's now almost 48 years ago. So um, I based some of it on my own experience. But uh, in 1984, I heard about Ascended Masters, which are spiritual teachers. They are the spiritual teachers for all people. And uh, so I studied those teachings for a long time. And in 2002, I started working directly with them to bring forth a lot of teachings. So it covers a really wide spectrum uh, from cosmological topics about how the world was created, what the purpose of the world is, down to the practical aspects of the spiritual path and how we can systematically raise our consciousness. Mm. So you function almost as a sort of channel to the masters? Yeah, you could say that. Uh, I would say messenger because I feel like I take messages. The reason why I say that is because channeling is such a broad spectrum. There's so many kinds of channeling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. So if you are the messenger, what is the message? What is, if you could culminate all of the messages into one message, is that possible? Yeah. I mean, obviously there could be many ways to do this, but uh, the basic thing I would say is it's possible to systematically raise our consciousness. Mm. And that means that we can overcome all of the human tendencies, the ego, the the sense of separation, the sense of aloneness. And we can systematically raise the same kind of higher consciousness that we saw in the Buddha, in Jesus, and in other spiritual masters. Mm. And uh, this, of course, means we, uh, we feel more at peace with being on Earth. It also means that we are more able to uh, be creative and express our higher beings in our everyday activities and in our service to life. But in the end, it also has the possibility that we can come to a point where we have, uh, we basically accomplished everything we wanted to accomplish on Earth. We have, sort of, so to speak, we're ready to graduate from schoolroom Earth and ascend. Mm -hmm. And that's why I talk about ascended master, because many of them have ascended from Earth. They started out just like us, walked the spiritual path, raised their consciousness over lifetimes, of course. It doesn't happen in five minutes. And then they ascended, and now some of them are working with us to help us who are unascended. Ah, oh. oh. So the main message of the masters is pretty much you can become a master too. Yeah, the, the motto of the ascended masters is what one has done, all can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much the main message of Buddhism. You know, Buddha yes, showed the yes. way. But uh, Gautama Buddha is an ascended master. So, mm. wow. So is Jesus, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who um, are these masters and how many are there that you work with? Well, I don't know how many there are in total. Uh, I work with about, a, I would say, a dozen on a regular basis, but I have taken messages from probably between 50 and 60 in total. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little bit more, actually. but. Um, so who are they? Well, the, the most known is, of course, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he's also the most misunderstood. There, if you look at Buddhism, for example, um, Buddhism has not um, deviated from or distorted the original message as much as Christianity has. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Christianity has uh, disinterpreted Jesus' message to the point where it's unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Jesus so, uh, became a false idol. Yeah, go ahead. 
essentially. Yeah, they turned him into an idol. Yeah, I mean, they really have. And and you look at what we just talked about. What one has done, all can do. So uh, the way the Ascended uh, Masters explain it is that we have these cycles, you know, about a 2000 year cycle. And you've obviously heard about the age of Pisces. We're moving into the age of Aquarius. So Jesus came at the beginning of the age of Pisces. In large part to demonstrate that we can all raise our consciousness and attain what he demonstrated the Christ consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But of course, what happened uh, when the Catholic Church was formed, was that they turned Jesus into an exception. He is the only Son of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they totally destroyed him as an example by setting it up that it's blasphemy to think you can do what Jesus said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the Christ conspiracy right there. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's why, you know, um, most spiritual people I have met, and over 40 years, I have met a lot of spiritual people. Um, they're turned off by Christianity. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, many of them, uh, they identify Jesus with the Christian religion. And mm -hmm. therefore, they are not really open to the fact that he might have a different message mm -hmm. than Christianity does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I actually have a whole website called uh, askrealjesus.com mm -hmm. that talks about, you know, the real message of Christ and and what it means for us today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And they're all the same message, right? All the masters in their own way, in their own Dharma, are really just saying the same thing is you can do it too. You can free yourself too. But nobody's going to yeah, do it. Yeah. The main you. message, you know, is that um, most human beings on earth have become trapped in a very specific state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And we can call it the illusion of separation. We, are, we have the illusion that we are separate beings, meaning we are separated from our spiritual source, we are separated from other human beings, and we are separated from the planet. Uh, and that illusion was created from a specific state of consciousness called the duality consciousness or the dualistic state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the, the unfortunate thing about the dualistic state of consciousness is that once you are in it, it becomes a self-reinforcing illusion mm. mm -hmm. because our, our minds become closed systems. And as you can see in the world, you know, many people, they're only looking for validation of what they want to believe. And once you're in duality, you can always find validation for what you want to believe. And you can always find arguments that uh, supposedly counteract anything questioning what you want to believe. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's very difficult to get out of this state of consciousness when you're, once you're in it. And that really is what the spiritual path is about and the spiritual path that has been taught throughout the ages by mystics and, and true spiritual teachers. Mm -hmm. So how do you recommend we untie the knot of this separation consciousness that we have tied for ourselves you know where do we start well i think we have to see it as a gradual path mm -hmm. because um i i like to compare it to here you are you are in front of this maze this labyrinth and so when you decide and um, of course it's a, a whole complicated teaching, but we use our free will to go into this state of separation. So we're standing in front of this maze, and we make a decision to go into the maze. Then we make another decision to turn right, and then we turn left, and then we go deeper and deeper into the maze. And once we are in it, we can't see the exit, and we forget that there's anything outside the maze. So in order to get back to the exit, we have to retrace our steps and undo all of these decisions we made. And we have to do this consciously. So that's why I'm saying it's a gradual path. It takes time. There, there are teachers out there who say, oh, you can just become spontaneously enlightened. And yeah. I just don't uh, look at it that way. I, mm -hmm. I don't agree with that view. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so we have to retrace our steps and it takes time. And one of the reasons why it takes time is that we, once we go into this 
separation, we create a separate sense of self, a separate self sense of identity. And we can't handle, if, if we were to instantly shift from that separate identity back to a non-dual sense of identity, we couldn't handle it. We yeah. were going through an identity crisis. We wouldn't know who we were. I've actually met a few people who had such a strong experience that they ended up in a mental institution. Mm. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have to, to walk a gradual path where we adjust our sense of who we are until we come to that point where we can see these dualistic illusions. But, mm. but it helps, of course, a lot to know that we are trapped in a certain state of consciousness and to understand how the duality consciousness works. You know, and that's why in some of my videos on uh, non-duality, I have a whole series of non-duality videos. The one thing I say over and over again is that what surprises me about many of these teachers to talk about non-duality is that they don't talk about duality and the duality consciousness. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's just all because, about non-duality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and see, they have created this image that there's this wonderful state up there called non-dual awareness. And some of them say, there is no path that leads to it. You, you're either awakened or you're not awakened. So you just have to sit around and wait for this spontaneous awakening. Uh, but that has never been I, my approach. My, I'm always a practical person. Give me something. Give me something where I can start. And uh, I can see how over the last 48 years, I have changed my consciousness so dramatically. But it has happened step by step so that I could keep up with it. You know, and um, I think we can't, we can't make that switch. I'm not saying that some people haven't made a dramatic switch in this lifetime. But that's in my view because they did work in previous lifetimes where they approached that turning point. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so for me, you know, it, it's like saying, uh, just look up there at the goal and wait for it to happen spontaneously. Whereas what I'm saying is, look, ask yourself a simple question. Why are you not in a non-dual state of awareness right now? Because something took you out of it. Yeah. And what took you out of it was these dualistic illusions. But you made a decision to accept them. And you have to undo those decisions in order to get back to a non-dual state of awareness. So if you look at, you know, they always talk about non-duality, right? But look at the word, non-duality. So if you are not talking about duality and the duality consciousness, you are, in my opinion, giving people a goal but you are not giving them a step-by-step -step path to reach that goal. Mm. Mm -hmm. And to me, that makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, I speak to a lot of those people too, just to, you know, have a conversation to understand where they all come from, to try to understand. But I feel the same way. There's just holes in that logic of spontaneous, non-dual awareness. It's not that easy, even though they would say it is that easy. Just be here now, but mm, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think it's like that. Find videos out there, and I've seen now, I think there's a growing number of them, of people who went into these, followed these non-dual teachers for years, some of them. And then they came to a point where they realized it, they hadn't actually gotten anywhere. Mm -hmm. Some of them said, I felt great for a while, but then all of a sudden I was just back to my old patterns. Yeah. And what I'm saying is the reason for this is that you haven't resolved this underlying psychology, the dualistic aspects of a psychology. Yeah. So and, and so but, it's possible to have a great experience. I mean, I had when I was uh, 19, I took a meditation course. This was transcendental meditation you probably heard of. Mm -hmm. And um, four months in Switzerland. And in the last month, we had these Vedic teachings. We did some Vedic meditations. And I had a lot. I had so many non-dual experiences that it almost blew my mind. I really almost didn't know who I was. And it was very, very hard to come back to a normal life. And 
when I hear some of these videos out there, people are talking about this experience that I had, but they're talking about it as if this is the final awakening or the final enlightenment. Yeah. Yeah. But see, I had that 46 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you that was not the final state of enlightenment mm -hmm. that I reached at that age, you know. Uh, so I have gone through so much stuff in my psychology since then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would you say that is the work? Uh, it's like after we get the glimpse and know that we are in the labyrinth and we are in the maze, the work of finding our way out of the maze is going within and then thus changing up our patterns and our changing up our lifestyle. And uh, yeah. from there, we don't get caught up in the, the separation patterns that we used to sell. Yeah, the way I explain it is that um, we are creating, when we go into separation, we are creating what I call subconscious selves. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I call it this is that, you know, everything we do is done with energy and everything we do is done with consciousness. So we go into this state of separation and we accept a certain illusion so that illusion is the basis for taking a step into the labyrinth mm. but because we are conscious beings we are we are actually creating a certain self and that self almost takes on a life of its own it's it's not conscious like we are but it has a certain survival instinct so it wants to keep us in a certain pattern like the ego now, if you is take what people would say? Yeah, but mm -hmm. it's just that, you know, I remember when I first started reading about ego, that was probably back in the 1990s, I think. And what always struck me at, is that the most, of the, most of the people who talked about ego, it was like this big amorphous entity. And you couldn't really pinpoint, couldn't really say what it was. And there was, again, this almost all or nothing attitude that some had either you're ego free or you have ego so what's liberating for me at least about these cells is that these are the components of the ego you know they're individual components so let's say that uh, just to give you an example right when you were a child and learned to ride a bicycle first it seemed almost impossible to hold the bicycle upright mm -hmm. it just wants to lie down all the time mm -hmm. And take you with it, of course. And, but after a while, it suddenly become, became automatic. And that's because you now programmed into the subconscious mind how to ride the bicycle. And all of a sudden, you didn't have to think about it consciously how to keep the bicycle balanced. Mm. So you could start looking around, you know, making sure you didn't run out in front of a car and get killed. And uh, so this is how we create these subconscious selves. It's not so much about riding a bicycle, but uh, let's say you have a, let's say you have people who get angry with you. How do you react to that? Some people react by becoming defensive yeah. and you start attacking them back. Others become submissive and feel guilty and want to apologize and explain and this and that. And either reaction comes from one of your subconscious selves that you created probably in past lifetimes where you were attacked by people. The one thing you always hear about spiritual masters is that they don't have the kind of reactions to situations in life that we do. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My first uh, spiritual book was Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi. And he's talking about this in there, how he, uh, as he walked the path, he became less and less reactive. You know, he didn't have these strong reactions that he had when he was younger. And for me, it was always uh, inspiring to hear the story about Gautama Buddha, who when he was, he, again, he walked a path, but when he was ready to go into Nirvana, he had to face the initiation that the demons of Mara mm -hmm. had to parade in front of him and try to tempt him into reacting. Yep. And if he had had any kind of reaction to anything on earth, he couldn't have gone into Nirvana. So in other words, he had to be non-attached. Yeah. And it's all of these subconscious cells that we have that have attachments. Each mm -hmm. self has an attachment to a specific, a specific way of looking at life, a specific way of reacting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we have to overcome all of those before we are free to exit the maze. Yeah. Uh, and that's essentially karma, right? 
Yeah, you could call it karma. Yeah, but mm. but karma is is especially in Eastern teachings used differently. I mean, the way I first heard about karma was it's more like a uh, misqualified energy. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, you uh, you're doing everything with energy, and if you do something out of fear, for example, it misqualifies the energy of a lower vibration. And it can accumulate in your energy field, and it can also be it's, it's projected out and comes back to you. But uh, that's only the outer mechanical aspect of karma. The inner aspect is that you have these selves, these attachments, and you are not really free of the karma before you resolve a self. You know, you come to see it as an illusion and say, why am I reacting this way? I don't want to react this way. And then you're free. Mm -hmm. mm. So essentially, the ascension process is us being free of all uh, emotional reactions here. Um, things that keep us tied to the sense of separate self, which is essentially just me. Like I am not attached to the universe essentially i am just me here poor me woe is me and that sort of mindset is what keeps us here and blocks the ascension when yeah yeah it also blocks your peace of mind and your ability yeah. to enjoy life or be creative yeah. mm -hmm. because you're always reacting and and so you you see people uh you can see people out there who are totally reacting their whole lives they're in this reactionary mode mm. and as spiritual people of course we are walking the path of gradually overcoming all those reactionary patterns so we are free first of all we're free to choose our reactions to specific situations mm -hmm. but we also can come to that point where we're ready to ascend and the ascension you know everything is is free will this is another thing I disagree with some of the non-duality teachers on who say we don't have free will. But everything is based on free will. We chose to go into duality and separation, and we have to choose to go out of it. So the ascension is a process where you might say you're freeing your will from any kind of attachment to anything on earth. Mm -hmm. So you come to a point where you can make a completely free choice to leave the earth behind permanently. Oh, yeah. And it's just like I said with Gautama Buddha, when you're standing in, let's just figuratively speak and say you're standing in front of a gate. And if you walk through that gate, you're leaving the earth behind forever. Mm -hmm. So before you can make the choice to walk through that gate, you have to look back at earth. And if there's anything here that pulls you back here, you can't walk through the gate. Yeah. And what pulls you back is these attachments, but it can also be a positive. It can be that you have in your life plan something you want to do, something you want to accomplish, or even experience on Earth. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the negative karma that ties us to Earth. It can also be a sense that there's something we haven't finished. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That just brings up the idea of the Bodhisattva, as in they're like enlightened beings, but they don't really want to leave until everyone else is enlightened and i can kind of see that you know like you can't yeah. ascend until everyone else ascends and that makes the most well, sense I, ha I have a series of videos uh called avatar psychology mm -hmm. and it talks especially about this uh and the idea is that in the past distant past without going into too much because it's a long story mm -hmm. but uh there were a group of spiritual beings who volunteered to come to Earth to hold a certain spiritual balance for Earth, for the growth of the Earth. Because the Earth is a very low planet. You know, we, we look at all the things that are going on on Earth, you know. And so this is, to me, what the Bodhisattva ideal is talking about. We volunteer to come here to help the Earth grow. And therefore, some of us can have the sense that we are not ready to leave yet. And that's perfectly legitimate. That's not karma that ties you to earth, and it's, it's your choice. Yeah. Mm. So in that way, is there some kind of plan for earth that you've been uh, bestowed the message with? As in, like, you know, earth isn't in a good place right now, but is the plan to make it a more decent place? Absolutely. I mean, that's, there's an ascended master called Saint Germain. 
Mm -hmm. And he is going to be the main master for Earth for the next 2,000 years. Mm. And he has a plan to create a golden age on Earth. And in fact, uh, what the masters have explained, and I've actually talked about it in a couple of videos also. I have a video called, Is the World Getting Worse or Better? And I talk about how um, we are in a transition period from one age to the next, one spiritual cycle to the next. And as a result of that, um, there are certain things that need to change, of course. And there are people who are resisting that change. But because of the law of free will, this means that these people must be allowed to act out their unresolved psychology in more and more extreme ways. Mm. And that's what you see going on all over the planet. Uh, not only in terms of war, but also just how people talk to each other. Yeah. And, and they can't agree, they can't agree on this topic or that topic. And that's because the people who are not going up, the people who are not working on their psychology, overcoming these attachments, they have to act out the attachments in more and more extreme ways. And that's also the duality consciousness, you know, because in duality, there are always two polarities, two extremes. And most people are somewhere in between the two extremes, but some people are going more and more towards the extremes. So they eventually come to a point where they can see it and they've had enough of it and say, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. And that's why we, uh, we have to allow this to happen and not be so disturbed by it yeah. as spiritual people. Yeah, it's interesting. That's how I see, and I think you've definitely described this too, uh, earth as it's like a school uh it's a yeah. school of uh, suffering essentially and the suffering is what brings us to the that point that you described as okay there's got to be another way i can't do this anymore and that essentially is what gets us on the path um so earth can be looked at as a lowly place but in essence it's actually just a really good school <laughs> it's a really efficient school. well it, it's a good school for people who are at a certain level of consciousness mm -hmm. see what, what i explain in these avatar videos is that and i actually have another video called how the world was created where i explain it in more detail there are two kinds of planets in our universe that's what i call natural planets and unnatural planets and on natural planets you don't people haven't gone into separation so that you don't have the selfishness, the self-centeredness, the well, us versus them mentality. Mm -hmm. But on Earth, you obviously do. And that's why Earth is an unnatural planet. So the plan of the Ascended Masters is, of course, to uh, raise the Earth so it again becomes a natural planet. It was in the past. And, and so, um, so it's a good schoolroom for those who are in the duality consciousness, in the illusion of separation. Yeah. But it's it's a hard schoolroom because it's what the masters call the school of hard knocks. Mm -hmm. Because you, you see, when you go into duality, and this is this is what I really think is important to understand if you are into this non-duality teachings, is that when you go into duality, your mind becomes a closed system. It becomes self-validating, self-referential. Because in the duality consciousness, there are always two polarities. And they are relative to each other, so none of them are true, right? It's like you have the spiritual realm where there's reality, but in duality, everything is, is an illusion. But of course, people don't see it that way. So people define some dualistic polarity or belief system or religion, and they elevate it to the status, this is the absolute truth. Uh -huh, yeah. And when they do that, their minds become closed because they won't listen to anybody who tells them different. They won't listen to the ascended masters who say there's a higher truth. And they won't look at the evidence that their belief system isn't working. Mm -hmm. mm. So that's why they're in the school of hard knocks. And they have to simply become more and more extreme, more and more fanatical, you might say, more and more aggressive. Until the knocks become so hard, they simply say, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. There's got to be another way. Interesting. Yeah, so it's a school. But it's an unnatural school. This isn't actually the way. Um, you know, there's other planets that, according to you, are natural and aren't schools, right? And that's just eventually well, they are also to... schools. It's just a different way because different there we have spiritual teachers we can work with. I we see. also work with each other. We help each other, uh, give each other feedback. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's almost like if you, if you look at it this way, you know, on a natural planet, everybody's trying to raise their consciousness. Mm-hmm. You know, they are constantly seeking to grow. So it's a better school. On an unnatural planet like Earth, most people are not seeking to raise their consciousness because they believe they're already right. They already have oh, the truth. Yep. You know, I don't know if you ever talked to a fundamentalist Christian, no, but uh, <laughs> there aren't very many in Denmark where I grew up, but I lived in the United States for 22 years and I met some of them. And they are completely convinced that they have the truth. Mm-hmm. And in uh, that Jesus will come and save them one day. It's it's almost like the non-dual people who are saying, oh, just wait for the spontaneous awakening. The Christians uh-huh. are just waiting for Jesus to come back, you know. <laughs> yeah. the but they, they believe, I don't have to look at myself. Now, you see, what did Jesus say 2,000 years ago? He said, why are you looking at the splinter in your brother's eye instead of looking at the beam in your own eye? Well, yeah. the beam in your own eye is your unresolved psychology, these subconscious selves. Mm. And But people who go into duality, they don't want to do that. So they are in a state of denial. And as I said, in duality, you can, you can, it's what I call plausible plausibility and plausible deniability. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can always find a dualistic argument that seems to validate what you want to believe. And that's why you have so many people that can't agree, because they are talking from this state of separation. Mm-hmm. And they are saying, my relative truth is absolute. And the other person say, no, my relative truth is absolute. Mm-hmm. You know, Christianity is the only true religion. No, Islam is the only true religion. Mm-hmm. And that's why, you know, people can't communicate. Yeah. They can't see it's the same coin, two sides of the same coin. Yeah, yeah. They can't see that both are actually illusions. Yeah. You know, yeah. but that's what you can see on a natural planet. You know, on a natural planet, your mind is not a closed system. So you know there's more to understand. And that's what, when you find a spiritual path here on Earth also, you know, the most important realization you can come to is that there is more to grasp than what I grasp right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what you unfortunately see is that many people who they find a spiritual teaching, they find a spiritual guru, and then they go into the same mindset. Oh, now I have the truth. Yeah. yeah. And on the spiritual path, you don't really want to do that. No. Because Always then you, do. how can you discover something new? Yeah, exactly. That's what the path's all about, you know, right? Never-ending newness. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, what I explain in, in this video about how the world was created is that the entire universe, the entire world of form, was actually created by one being. I call it the creator. But the purpose of it is to have individual extensions of the creator who start with this very localized sense of self and gradually expand it up through many layers until we reach the same level of consciousness as the creator. So the entire universe is actually a creator school. That's powerful stuff. So it is. Yeah. But once you get a certain experience of what the creator's consciousness is like, you also realize that is way, way up there compared to anything we can have on earth. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, we are so far away from that. And that's why, you know, when you have these people who say, oh, this guru reached enlightenment, uh, God realization, the highest level of consciousness. I'm mm-hmm. saying, ah, you really think so? You know, mm-hmm. you really think so uh, that on this low planet, you can reach the highest level of consciousness? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I mean, yeah. I mean, just look around, you know. To be honest, it's a shithole of a planet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is being real. It's very true. It is good to have that mindset. It's sort of a ghetto. Yeah, here. and I, I, you know, you look at it. I mean, I understand where this all comes from. I've gone through it myself. You know, in a lot of my videos, I talk about what I've gone through myself. So when I was uh, 18 years old and found a spiritual path, Of course, I thought that I had the truth and I was the smartest person on earth because I could see this and I was just a hair's breadth away from the highest level of consciousness, you know. But that was 48 years ago and a lot of illusions Mm -hmm. that have come and gone. And so today I I don't even worry about what level of consciousness I'm at. I'm just always looking for the next illusion to overcome Mm -hmm. because my attitude is as long as I'm in embodiment on this planet, I have illusions to overcome. Mm. 
And if I allow myself to go into this state of mind that I see some people rushing into, uh, that I have reached the highest level of consciousness, then obviously I can't see the next illusion. But if I can't, even if I have one illusion left, I can't ascend. Yeah. I'll have to re-embody on Earth. Wow. No, and and I don't want to re-embody. I want to ascend after this lifetime. Mm -hmm. That's very wise. That's very wise. Well, it's just my decision. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with somebody taking the bodhisattva idea. I mean, there are people, it, they have decided they want to stay in embodiment and help St. Germain manifest that golden age. Mm -hmm. And that's just as valid, you know, but, but it's just some people are coming to that point where we say, ah, I've been here long enough. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel as though this whole conversation and everything on your channel and my channel only makes sense in the context of reincarnation because most people in the separation mindset are in the paradigm of this is my one life this is my only life i'm gonna live it up while i'm here and then if i go to church on sunday i'll get to heaven and then you know so forth but when you put into no, I context, totally agree with you. yeah mm -hmm. when you put into context we might have done this over and over again and we're reliving past trauma from previous lifetimes and it all makes sense and that yeah. you might have to do it again you might have some unresolved stuff after this do you really want to come back then that's when true spirituality i feel like enters one's life um so yeah reincarnation is a huge um revelation that i feel as though is important to this whole path in in uh in understanding what that oh, all means right? i agree with you 100 yeah. percent. i mean i can't see how you can explain what's happening on earth uh without reincarnation but i especially can't you know you can come up with various arguments for reincarnation but to me it all boils down to that i have looked at so many things in my psychology and i had discovered traumas and i had a very easy childhood compared to most spiritual people i met and there is just no way i could have received those traumas in this lifetime yeah makes so sense. where does that complicated psychology come from mm -hmm. but look at history how likely is it that i haven't in past lifetimes been exposed to war and torture and murder and mayhem and i could have gotten traumas there that i'm carrying with me because in order to respond to a trauma we create these subconscious selves mm -hmm. you know and and one of the ways we do it is and i explained that in my avatar series that when we first came to Earth from a natural planet, the contrast between a natural planet and Earth was so huge that it was an enormous shock to us. Mm -hmm. You call it birth trauma? And, and in what? You call it birth trauma? Yeah, I call it the cosmic birth trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, not our birth in this lifetime, but when we first came to Earth. Oh. And so, so the thing is, you know, you talked about how it can be difficult to live on this planet and many people many spiritual people who are sensitive you know why are we spiritual because we're sensitive but we're also sensitive to all the things that are going on and then those of us who are avatars we know there's an alternative it doesn't have to be the way it is on earth mm -hmm. so in reality as a spiritual person you can't live psychologically on earth you can't survive psychologically if you look at all the things that are going on you're saying I can't deal with it. Yeah. So in order to deal with it, especially when we were exposed to these traumas, we create these subconscious selves that are suppressing it, denying it, essentially. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's how we could deal with what happened to us in past lifetimes. But the thing is, since then, those of us who are walking the spiritual path, we have raised our consciousness. So we wouldn't react the same way today that we did back then. Mm -hmm. I see. And therefore, we can resolve those selves and overcome the trauma. Mm -hmm. wow. you know, and that's also part of why it's important, as I explained in some of my videos about the Ascended Masters, they've given us these tools to invoke spiritual energy that can transform the fear-based energy that have, has accumulated in our energy fields. Mm -hmm. Because that's also part of what makes it difficult to look at trauma. Would you be able to go over some of those tools or techniques or would that be too much? Yeah, probably a little much, but I mean, it, it's a te techniques where you basically use the spoken word. 
mm-hmm. to uh, it's it's like a chant, but given a little bit different differently, to uh, call to a specific ascended masters to uh, invoke their high frequency spiritual light. For example, Saint Germain has released a violet flame energy, and the violet flame is very good for transforming uh, fear based energy. You know, uh, you're familiar with the aura, of course. Yep. And for me, the aura is an energy field that has an emotional component, a mental component, and an identity level component. And especially in that emotional uh, level of the aura, the emotional body, all kinds of anger, fear, energies can accumulate. And over many lifetimes, they can have accumulated and that's why they they pull on our conscious mind so you're exposed to a situation and you are just pulled by the subconscious selves and by this energy into reacting with anger Mm. but if you invoke spiritual light to transform the energy then you can be free of it and then it's much more easy to look at the psychology behind it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the other thing is you know um the ascended masters are always wanting to give us more spiritual energy so we can be more and more creative. But until we have uh, dissolved some of that energy in, in, uh, in our auras that are fear-based energy, it will block the flow of energy through our energy fields. Mm-hmm. So as you clear this out, you, became, you become much more uh, creative, much more energetic. Oh, I see. I mean, I can look back at, at my life. I've, I've been giving these decrees and invocations since 1984. And it's had an amazing effect on uh, overcoming these patterns and also just becoming more energetic and more mm-hmm. peaceful. Mm. Yeah. I mean, for me, that was, that was the biggest difference in my spiritual path was learning how to invoke this spiritual energy and working with the Ascended Masters too, mm. to open up the flow. We're, we're meant to have this flow. It's like uh, Jesus even said it 2,000 years ago. He said, I can on my own self do nothing. Mm. because we are constantly the, the reason why we are conscious the reason why we can do anything is we are constantly receiving a stream of energy from our higher selves and the ascended masters and this is what allows us to do something but when there's too much energy accumulated in our energy fields it can't flow there can't be that figure eight flow mm-hmm. and that's why people aren't energetic they aren't creative they aren't so conscious they aren't so aware and so when you open up that flow you become much more energetic, much more aware, basically. Yeah. But you also have more creativity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like to say a human being is like the paintbrush of God. You know, we're not the sole creator, but we create through some kind of higher force. Yeah. We are co creators. Yeah. yeah. You know, as I said earlier, we are actually, we start out with a very localized sense of self, we expand it. And as we expand it, we become more and more creative, but we realize that we're not creating on our own. We're not creating as separate beings. We're mm-hmm. created as connected beings. Yes. Mm-hmm. So the basic choice we have, you can say, is do we see ourselves as separate beings or as connected beings? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you can, you, can, you can find a spiritual path or a spiritual teaching, and you can think you're following the spiritual path. But it's really your separate sense of self, your ego that's driving your spiritual growth or your your spiritual efforts. Because there comes that point where you have to switch and look at the inner path, which is about connecting to your higher self and overcoming all of that psychology and energy that separates you, that pulls you into separation. Mm -hmm. That's really what the spiritual path is about in in its essence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (sighs) Wonderful stuff. You're very well spoken, Kim. This is awesome. <laughs> well, 48 years, you know. <laughs> 48 years. That's, yeah, that's Hopefully, you'll pick up a few things. <laughs> yeah, and probably previous lifetimes as well, like we said. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. I think the important part about what you said, too, is that not only this whole thing about essentially escaping the, uh, the lowly life of Earth, but also enjoying life while we're here, finding a sense of ease and joy and happiness amidst the darkness, you know, finding a little bit of light amidst the darkness or the kingdom of heaven within, as Jesus said. I think that's really what we all yearn for in one way or the other is finding some sense of joy while we are still embodied here. Well, that's a really good point. I mean, 
you, you take that statement, the kingdom of God is within you. Mm -hmm. What is within you? Your consciousness. Mm -hmm. So what Jesus actually meant, it's not that the kingdom of God is some remote place up there in heaven. The kingdom of God is a state of consciousness where we are connected. Yeah. yeah. That's why I said, I can of my own self do nothing. The Father within me doeth the work. That means the Father within is your higher self. Mm -hmm. But it's important to realize that we are, it, it's a good saying, uh, we are the paintbrush of God, but we are not, uh, we are not just tools. We are co-creators. We have free will. We have self-awareness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not mm -hmm. like God is sitting there forcing us, you know, we yeah. are choosing what we want to do and how we want to manifest. And that's why, that's why humankind has been able to create the mess you see on earth because they have used their free will. Mm -hmm. But we can learn to use our free will in a higher way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you talked about that in some video about free will. I think it was a very recent one. Um, how that's the highest law. And I like that. That's the highest law that there is. That's how in a certain way, war makes sense. Like all the darkness of the world makes sense. It's because of free will. And essentially it was our own doing. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's the only way you can really explain it in a logical manner. I feel like rationally, it's like, yeah, that was because we did that essentially. We dug our own grave in a certain way. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, you go into separation and you don't see yourself as connected to other people. That's why you can kill other people. Mm -hmm. And that's why you can think that you can get an advantage out of killing other people. Yeah. Whereas when you see yourself as connected, you realize you're killing others, you're killing a part of yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the planet. When we are into separation, we think we can do whatever we want with the planet. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see all the pollution and all the environmental problems. And connected beings wouldn't do that. No. No. It just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't compute. It just goes yeah. totally against our nature. Yeah. And, and actually, when we talk about natural and unnatural planets, on natural planets, there is no lack of resources. Mm. Mm -hmm. We don't have to fight with nature and take by force. It's just that when you go into this state of separation, you have to do everything by force. Mm. You can't co-create mm -hmm. because you cut yourself off from that flow of energy from your higher self. Yeah. So, so once a being is in separation it has to take energy from other people mm. and a lot of the you know war is basically really not about money or power or whatever it is it's about energy mm. yeah <laughs> yeah that's true fighting over energy yeah yeah i mean i'm not just physical energy but even psychic energy and yeah creative energy Oof. yeah some dark magic yeah, taking it by force. Instead of when you are a co-creator, you realize uh, spirit will gladly give you anything you need. Abundance rather than scarcity. Yeah. It's just you can't use it to destroy other people. Yeah. Or other parts of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's very interesting. We still live with war. It's boggling. Oh, it's mind-boggling. <laughs> yeah. I, I was, I don't remember, three or four or five years old when I realized what war was. Mm -hmm. And I was so shocked. I mean, I'm on a planet where there's war. How did that happen? <laughs> what? And I'm like, what? How? How? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. yeah. And when I first learned about this whole idea of the avatars that we have volunteered to come from a natural planet here, my first thought was, how could I be that stupid? <laughs> how could I volunteer to come uh, to this kind of a planet? Mm. No, but then I later made peace with it and realized that maybe it wasn't quite so stupid of a choice anyway. <laughs> well, some interesting times, at least, you know, we, we chose to be here during some very, very interesting times. I like to say this is, if we've had millions of lifetimes, thousands, who, who knows, this is the lifetime. This is the one where you can use the tools at our disposal like this, like what we're doing right now. And also tools such as you described as being able to know that there are ascended masters that we can tap into. Use those tools to our best ability to actually do free ourselves and liberate ourselves. When in previous lifetimes, we were caught in scarcity or poverty or we had no idea of the Dharma. When in this one, we have it all at our fingertips, in our pockets, all of this knowledge and guidance. 
is literally in our pockets. So it's up to us to be able to utilize that and essentially become a better people and lead a better life. I like to say, this is it, you know, use this time mm-hmm. wisely. We're not here for a very long time. And the fact that we were all born, me and you, you know this, obviously, preaching to the choir, mm-hmm. here. but anybody listening, use this time wisely to uh, essentially not have to be reborn. And you will thank yourself most likely uh, after this lifetime is over. <laughs> this is it. This is it, folks. Yeah, I agree. 100%. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a good way to look at it, you know, um, because you can overcome this sense of hopelessness or nothing really matters, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I look at some, I mean, I'm talking about non-attachment, right? Yep. But don't misunderstand that to mean that when you're non-attached, you don't care about anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that's not the case, you know. Uh, But it's just that you are not caring as a separate being. So you don't have those kind of self-centered, fear-based concerns. Mm. But obviously, uh, I care deeply about other people, about the planet. And I would really like to see St. Germain have a golden age. I would really like to see Jesus have, have the fruition of his mission which is to demonstrate that all people can reach that higher state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've dedicated my life to and how I've been working since, yeah, well, since I was 18 in a sense, uh, because since I was 18, there's only really been one thing that mattered in my life, and that was the spiritual path. Oh, it's very noble. That's awesome. No, it's just, I don't know if it's, I don't even look at it as noble. It's just, that's who I am. Yeah. And that's why I'm here, you know. Uh, I, I'm not here to have fun on earth. I'm not here to uh, enjoy many of the activities that people enjoy on earth. I'm here to be of service mm-hmm. and hopefully make some kind of positive difference, you know. And uh, I think many spiritual people have that sense. I have certainly met many over these 48 years, you know. Yeah. Um, I feel you on that. I feel like once I sort of got a glimpse into the whole path, that path of service becomes sort of obligatory it's like i need to serve in one way or the other and this is kind of my service right here what we're doing uh the yeah. like a the sort of selflessness that comes about is just like i said it's almost a duty it's like i kind of have to talk about this or i have to, you have to to a certain point because i see myself and others like it's not just me it's not just gary here anymore You know, what I am is essentially the whole planet. So I need to do with the little ability that I have as this being here on this planet for the short time that I'm here, uh, give back a little bit. That's sort of the resonance that I feel. It's like try to give back. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. And if not, I feel as though it would cause me suffering, right? Like if you didn't live in service at 18, if you decided to live a hedonistic lifestyle, you probably wouldn't be fulfilled in that way. So it's a way. Of course not. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see it as a duty as much as just a natural expression of yeah of who I am. Mm -hmm. I hear you saying the same thing, just with different words. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like it's just a shift in consciousness, you know. Uh, And and I think many spiritual people, if we think back, you know, I I remember, you know, uh, when I was fourteen, I had a newspaper route. So I was distributing newspapers every afternoon after school in this nice neighborhood, a little uh, higher middle class neighborhood. And I knew I could go to school and I could get a degree and I could get a house like this and I could have a car and I could live that lifestyle. I knew that was within my reach. But I also knew even at that age, I had no idea of a spiritual path. I knew I can't do it because it's not enough for me. Mm. There has got Mm. to be something else in life besides this. Yeah. Yeah. And and when I found the spiritual path, I knew instantly this is it. This is what I've always been looking for. Mm. Let me ask you that one. How did you find this? How did you come to find that this is the path? I feel like that's an important step for all of us to know that there is another way. So what was the uh dawning for you? Well, I, I was always thinking, I was always sensitive, I could always sense energy. Mm-hmm. So during my childhood, I, I knew there had to be something more to understand about life. I just didn't find anything. 
in the outer. Yep. But the masters have a saying that when a student is ready, the teacher appears. So when I was 18, I moved away from home uh, to go to college. And I was, I was always looking for things. And I had, for that matter, been looking for books my whole life, but I just never found any books. So I'm walking into this bookstore and I see this book. And I, I take it down and I open it and there's these pictures of Yogananda and his guru and other gurus. And it's autobiography of a yogi. And I just knew I had to buy this book. So I bought it. I went home and I spent the whole weekend reading it. And that was really what made me realize there is something else there. And then at, at about the same time, I met some people at college who went to Transcendental Meditation. And since there wasn't a chapter of Yogananda's organization, I went into Transcendental Meditation. I met my first wife there. and She was a teacher. And I took some classes to also start becoming a teacher. And so that was kind of how I started it. And, and then after some years, we got dissatisfied with the transcendental meditation movement and then i mean, actually had a couple of years i was kind of in a vacuum i didn't have any spiritual teaching i read a few books here and there but then we heard about uh, ascended masters and got really um, enthusiastic about that and we actually we actually moved with our two young children to the united states where there was an organization called the summit lighthouse that had its international headquarters there and then I just was in that organization for 15 years. I lived in the United States. And uh, then eventually, uh, I started working with the masters myself. Mm. Oh, that's awesome. I feel like I should have asked you that at the beginning. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't um, matter. <laughs> but for me, Yogananda's book was like, it opened up this whole... In a, at a conscious level, what I knew unconsciously, there oh. is an alternative to the ordinary lifestyle. Yeah. And it's this systematic path of raising our consciousness. Yep. The path of yoga. Mm -hmm. the true path. Yeah, that's how he describes it. But there's, of course, other ways. And there, there, are, mm -hmm. there are several ways. And it's not like I'm not, I'm not the kind of person who says there's only one way that works for all people. And people have to find what works for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I wouldn't have been ready for the Ascended Master teachings when I was 18. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. so so I look at it that uh, transcendental meditation was a necessary step on my path, and then I found the Ascent of Master teachings. But even that has changed over time how I look at that, how I relate to the masters, and how I understand the teachings at deeper levels. Mm. I see. Yeah. So, would you say though um, there are different paths? We all have our different dharma in this life, as one would describe. Um, but it all has to do with giving up our sense of self, like our sense of separate self, like whatever flavor or way that you want to go about it, however it's described. It really just comes down to sort of extinguishing the ego and it's all me, it's all mine, competitive mindset and more into uh, community, you know, cooperation, knowing that we're all in this together and that you are connected to everyone and everything here. Um, just different ways to go about finding that out. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. I mean, the way I say it is just different words, you know. But mm -hmm. the way I say it is that those of us who are spiritual people, we have what I call a life plan. Mm -hmm. And um, before we come into this embodiment, we meet with our spiritual teachers, which are, I call them ascended masters. They've been called other things, but I just like that terminology, ascended masters. And so... Each of us has at least one and usually several uh, spiritual teachers we're working with you know, over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So we look at uh, our potential for the next lifetime, this lifetime, and we look at our history. You know, and then we, together with our spiritual teachers, we are making a plan for what we want to accomplish in this lifetime. And it has two basic elements. One is the growth we want to go through. And that's like you said, overcoming the ego overcoming these reactionary patterns, these separate selves, so we are more free to be creative. And then the other is our service. You know, what can we do? What can we bring forth that's something new? Mm -hmm. And uh, I very much feel that, that, you know, I have been somewhat in attunement with that uh, plan most of my life. And I've met many spiritual people who can see they also have. I mean, we may have some lapses where we go into not really knowing, mm. but uh, 
by and large, we have done what we needed to do uh, to go through these stages. Mm. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing we have to realize about this is that, you know, it, it's so easy to think, oh, it's supposed to be all wonderful. But part of what we have to go through is to free ourselves from this unresolved psychology. Mm. And in many cases, we can see, yeah, I've had this particular separate self for several lifetimes. It's caused me to react in certain ways to life, which has given me a lot of trouble. I want to overcome it, but I can see that I have been reluctant to look at it. So what I'm going to do in this lifetime, which might be my last, as you said, is I'm going to put myself in a situation where I am forced to look at this. I can't just ignore it. Mm -hmm. and gloss it over. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see a lot of spiritual people who had either a very difficult childhood or they had difficult youth, someone got into drugs, someone got into all kinds of negatives. Uh, but this is all part of our life plan to, so to speak, force ourselves to see what we need to look at. Yeah. Because we know that it's fine to sit up there in between embodiments and look at this. But once we are down here in a dense physical body, we can't see what we can see when we made our life plan. Yeah. Mm. So many times we are, so to speak, from a higher perspective, we are forcing ourselves to deal with all of this stuff, the unresolved psychology. Mm. And it's not pretty and it's not fun. No, I can look at my life. I had periods where it wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and so we just have to, I mean, I eventually came to a point where I realized this is just what I need to go through to overcome these limitations so I can be free of them. Yeah. So I can be free to give that higher service and get on with my creative aspects of my divine plan. Mm -hmm. And many spiritual people, they are saying, I want to get rid of all this stuff first so that later in life I'm free to focus on the creative aspects of my life plan. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. why a lot of spiritual people have difficult childhood, difficult youth, difficult period. Um, but what does it matter? Because it's like, once you see what you need to see in your psychology, once you see those separate selves and you see that illusion, say, and, and you basically can come to a point where you say, this is not me. This is not who I am. Mm. And you let it go and you're free and you know you're free. Mm. Then the whole rest of your life is going to be very much different, very much better. Yeah. Mm. Well said. Very well said. You know what? I think that's a good note to wrap this thing up at. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, do you have anything else you want to say? You just want to keep it at that. Yeah, no, that's fine. All right. Yeah, it's much more we could say, but uh, if you ever want to do it again, then yeah, you just let me know. Yeah, you're, um, you're a real one, Kim. I really appreciate you coming on here. This is great. This is an honor for me to be able to do this and have this conversation and put it on recording for the world to see uh amazing times that we are in um yeah that's just uh I, it's just i'm i'm dumbfounded that i'm even able to do this and have be in the presence or virtual presence of people like you so keep on doing your thing yeah but 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 don't uh forget that you're also here <laughs> and you're also part of the whole thing yeah. you see this this is uh, okay so i will say one thing okay because this is in a way one of the worst aspects of spirituality mm -hmm. is this idolizing of the guru mm -hmm. where you set certain people up oh he is enlightened he is so special but we are all part of this greater plan to raise the planet we all have a, a role to play and none of us are more important than anybody else mm. we just do it in different ways yeah uh, we each have to find what is in our individual life plan and then be happy that we can do that, you know, and, and feel that we are all making. Who of us can save the planet alone? None of us can. Mm. Mm -hmm. It takes millions of us. Yeah. Amen to that. And we save ourselves to save the world. Yeah. 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 It's the beauty of it. Because we are all connected. Mm -hmm. we, we are all connected. So when you raise your consciousness, you are raising the whole. Yeah. yeah. And in separation, we can't see that. 
Mm-hmm. But that's the deeper reality is connectedness, oneness. Mm-hmm. Always one and one is all. It's really yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Wonderful. Well, yeah, thank you, Kim. Keep doing your thing. I really appreciate you yeah. coming on here. Um, I'll link all of your stuff down in the description for people to check out. But that's it. I don't have anything else to say. And yeah, I think we can definitely tap in again in the future. I think we just touched the tip of the iceberg. But until then, yeah, yeah. I wish you all the best. Okay. Peace well, thank love. you, Gary. Peace and love. It's been a joy you. to be with you. Of course. Peace <laughs> and love to everybody that listened this long. See ya.